and we're turning now to dance and um, this will be Emma Campbell who teaches dance at Thornton Academy and um, she also is probably the most connected woman in the whole or woman or man in the whole state who knows more uh, than anybody else um, about who's teaching dance in our state, which is really wonderful. And we're so grateful to her for having that information. And she'll be talking with um, Mary Ellen Shaper, who is um, who is uh, a real main state treasure. Uh, Mary Ellen has been in education now for 42 years. She is now retired um, after an incredible career teaching every grade that you can think of. and in dance and physical education, uh, private and public school. She has been very, very active in designing dance curriculum and dance standards in the main learning results. And she has won numerous awards. Um, but uh, anyway, we've been able to draw her out of retirement and we look forward to hearing them both uh, talk about dance and to show their wonderful video, which I have already seen and is just spectacular. Good morning. Hi, Emma. How's it going? Good. Um, I guess I go first. Sure. Okay. I'm seeing your screen, but that's all right. Um, what what I was asked to talk about um, was sort of what the background of dance in Maine and dance education in Maine. And since I taught some grade levels that Emma has not is not teaching, so that we get that. Um, Interestingly enough, um, it's, I, I always find it very ironic that dance is the most accessible art form because all you need is your body. You don't need clay, you don't need paper, you don't need an instrument. I would argue that vocal um, it, it music would be right there with it. But in the case of dance, it's the least visible um, in Maine public schools. Um, when we talk about, when Commissioner Macon talked about equity of opportunity, I really hope as we go forward, that's going to include dance because as Emma, as Emma was introduced, she really has a handle on that. And I know having preceded her in that role, um, it's, it really needs to have an equity of opportunity. Private studios don't count. Okay. Um, so dance has always been an integral part of the cultural fabric of Maine. And historically, social dance uh, from Native American, Acadian, Scottish, British, Irish, and French cultures, such as contra dance, have been very active in Maine. Some you all over Maine you see Grange Halls and stuff. One of the main functions of that was social dancing, like contra dancing and stuff. Uh, when some of my students in Hollis for the bicentennial several years ago and their research, they found out some of these big houses also had, in their original architecture, they had ballrooms in their houses, which they found fascinating. Of course, they wanted to know if they did disco in those and I said, maybe, um, <laughs> but uh, that's always been part of our fabric. And as uh, the culture of new Mainers grows, as we get more new Mainers in the state, um, that's gonna be a, you know, an important part of our fabric as well. Um, schools started incorporating dance in the colleges and state and private colleges. Um, for example, I'm gonna highlight two, Caroline Gentile at the University of Maine at Presque Isle is legendary for what she did. Margaret Gould Westcott at the University of Maine at Farmington also. Um, at Bates College, Laura Forrest started the Bates Dance Festival, which is an internationally known festival that brings dancers from all over the world here to dance and teach. It's pretty remarkable. In public schools, um, physical education was a place where dance was done, music education, drama, um, in individual classrooms and in integrated curricula. There's public ag agencies, most of which you guys all know, like MAC and stuff. But two that were really important were uh, VSA Maine, which uh, was the arts, including dance, for special populations. And that, that sadly has gone by the way. And dance education in Maine schools, which did workshops, residencies, 
do we developed the curriculum that you can now find on Eric if you thought of print, but it's on Eric if you wanted to look at it and certification in dance. Uh, the media has made dance something that kids want to learn, um, you know, and anything from so you think you can dance to TikTok, everything. So um, I just to go back to what when I was teaching, I was asked to just talk a little bit about that before Emma talks. We are doing it in a little different format. Um, basic love and vocabulary, which is time, space, force, flow, looking at all the different locomotor movements, such as walking, running, skipping, jumping, et cetera, non-locomotor movements like bending, stretching, and so forth. Um, that was the basic of what I taught and what I, you know, what Emma teaches too. Um, it's very process, I was very process oriented. I used it as a tool for self-discovery, integration into other subject areas as evidenced by my kids who did the research on the ballrooms of Hollis. It's a marvelous opportunity for kinesthetic learners, which most kids are, let's be honest. You know, how many kids do you know that sit still for a long period of time? Uh, none. Um, let's see. And some of my goals for this were to make them more efficient movers in general, uh, self-expression, give tools that can transcend, cool tools and confidence to transcend not only different dance forms, but movement in general. I had a school board member ask me once why dance was important. And I talked in terms of spatial relations and I said, what, what, a, what a, I said to him was that, you know, how many of you have ever seen somebody who can't park a car in a parking place, a par, not, an angled parking place in a parking lot? How many of you have seen people that can't maneuver their shopping carts in the grocery store? They had dance, they'd learn about spatial relationships and pathways and different things. And he didn't realize that. So, um, Dance is really, really important. And as I said, I hope moving forward, dance gets more visibility and, and has equity of opportunity to quote Commissioner Macon. That was my part of it, except to ask Emma a very important question because I'm not teaching now. I don't have to do, do the heavy lifting that she's doing right now. Um, how has your curricular content changed during this pandemic? I can imagine it's been phenomenal the changes yeah it's it's night and day and thank you for um sharing all the information with everyone i think it's just so important that people understand sort of where we have come from to where we are now before we can even understand the changes that have taken place this year um because it is a discipline where we face being the underdog every day so the the challenges of COVID are kind of just uh another thing that we have to hurdle over. Um, and it's something that we're used to doing, but just very briefly before we get to the film, um, I do teach dance full-time at Thornton Academy. We have a full curricular program there. And so if you're not familiar with that, um, that is what I do. Hence my background behind me. Um, and our curricular programming is very performance driven, um, because of the interconnectedness of our performing arts at our school but that has had to be a little bit different this year. Um, it's been good at Thornton and I'm just speaking about my school um, and not other schools because there are, they are few and far between. Um, and we are following the um, CDC guidelines for the safe return to school, which you'll see in the video. Um, some of the curricular changes have been that we are maintaining personal residence inside of a, um, box in the studio and there's no traveling um, or moving around just due to trying to be um, mindful of the excessive aerosolization. I don't even know if that's a word. Um, just <laughs> making sure we're not breathing in people's gross air is the way I would really say it. And um, we've still tried to do as much performance as we can um, because that in my experience, that's the reason why the kids want to be there. So I haven't tried to um, shift to like, you know, um, texts or video. We're still trying to do as much movement as possible. One, because I think they need it to get through the day. And two, to maintain that sense of normalcy. 
We did produce a virtual concert. Um, it will be available for another week and you can access that through all of Thornton's media platforms. Um, there's direct links on our Facebook page if you wanted to check that out. And that was a combination of instructor-led choreography, collaborative choreography, and student choreography. Um, we are in a hybrid model, so we have cohorts. So kids only are attending physical school two days per week. And so some of the choreography has been on Zoom. We've also had to go remote three times due to outbreaks. So we are pivoting, but we're dancers, so we're used to that. Um, some of it's done on the computer and that brings its own unique set of challenges. Um, but we were able to produce quite a bit for our virtual concert and there is a sneak peek of that in the video. So if Jason, if you wanna share that, that would be great. Dance at Thornton Academy looks a lot different this year. In a normal year, the studio would be bustling and full of students moving, sweating, and working together. This year, those things are still happening, but just in a slightly different way. The studio has been gridded out to allow maximum allowable space for each dancer of around six and a half feet. We have three rows of six boxes and kids are assigned to a box so they know where they are allowed to dance in during class. We would normally travel across the floor. However, we don't wanna be in space behind other dancers. So we are simply making do the best that we can in the space that we are given. Another thing that's different this year is the way that we are managing our curricular programming. A huge part of our program here at TA has been getting students ready to produce two concerts each year. Those concerts are going to take place, however, they may just be delivered in a slightly different method. Our first concert, which normally takes place in January, was released just this week as a virtual winter concert through an online streaming platform. We're not sure what the spring will bring for us, but we are still working towards creating some kind of performance for our community. The dance you are about to watch is titled Better Than Today and was created as a collaborative choreography project in my performance and repertory class. This dance was created as a way for students to explore their